Innovation, freedom, opportunity. It's time for the School Choice Nebraska podcast. Learn more at schoolchoicenebraska.org. Hey, welcome to the podcast. This is episode 11. It's about accountability. I haven't thought of a title yet. Um, And I'm going to have to talk fast because I got the cheap podcasting plan and there's only so much storage for December. But I wanted to give a shout out to Freddie B and Brian Mickelson. I had said on Twitter that I was going to do something about accountability and asked for some thoughts and you both responded. Thanks to that. And um, Brian, you talked about private schools should have to follow accountability measures. We're going to talk about that. And uh, Freddie B., talking about choice. We're going to talk about that too. Um, We're going to talk about actually two kinds of accountability. I hear all the time that only public schools have accountability and other kinds of schools don't. Two kinds of accountability. We have regulatory accountability and market accountability. Now regulatory accountability involves policies and regulations instituted by the government and market accountability involves feedback from the people who actually consume your services and products. So regulatory accountability is checklist accountability. So you can take a document, see what it requires of you, and check off the items. And the public school system prefers this kind of accountability. It's largely administrative, and it doesn't require the approval of parents. It doesn't value agility, and it's very top-down. Now, market accountability is much more difficult to achieve. To be accountable to the market is to figure out what people want and to consistently meet their expectations. That's difficult, and it's, it's an ongoing problem. It's not something that you decide once and then just do something. You have to be responsive. So let's take a look at these two kinds of accountability outside of the public school system and just to, just to get to know what they mean a little bit more. So let's say you want to start a restaurant. You're going to have to deal with both regulatory accountability and market accountability. So what kinds of things for regulatory? Well, you have to remit taxes. You need to train and compensate employees, keep up with food handling and safety requirements, obey minimum wage laws, allow inspections from the county, follow the terms of your lease, file business license paperwork and fees, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's the easy part. The hard part is dealing with market accountability. So sure, you can file all of your paperwork on time. You can meet the terms of your lease least, but can you be accountable to customers? You'll have to figure out what kind of food they want and you'll have to prepare it the same way every time they come. You'll have to train your employees to treat customers well because if they don't your customers won't come back. So all of this is the hard part and it's the reason that only the best restaurants survive. Very few restaurants go out of business because they don't comply with government regulations. They go out of business because they're not meeting consumer demand. Now, public schools are good at following regulations. So are private schools. If you look at the Nebraska Department of Education website, you'll find all kinds of regulations for both public and private schools. So I'm gonna read a few regulations I found on the NDE website. These regulations are specifically for, for private schools. Private schools have to comply with these things in order to um, to operate and be in good standing. There are a lot of big picture regulations, but I'm kind of shocked at the details of some of these. Okay, private schools in Nebraska. Each elementary, middle, and high school acquires a minimum of 25 new library media resources, exclusive of textbooks and encyclopedia of different titles per teacher per year, up to 150 titles during one year. Each middle and high school subscribes to at least 10 periodicals listed in the guide or indexed to periodicals used by the school. At least six are hard copy. Okay, let's see what else. A copy of the certificate or permit of each staff member who is required to have a certificate is on file in the school or school systems. Administrative office. Oh, this is kind of a funny one. Each elementary school has at least one set of encyclopedias which has a copyright date within six years of the current school year. Each secondary school has two sets of encyclopedia from different publishers with copyright dates in the past five years. Okay, it's great for schools to have good resources, but this level of detail is, I I think, probably counterproductive. Okay, so private schools have to deal with both regulatory and market accountability because they're competing with other private schools for the same few customers. 
Only a few families in Nebraska can afford to send their children to private school, and the schools have to be attractive to those who can choose. The public schools don't have to deal with market accountability. And this is a major reason they fight against school choice. What would happen if low- and middle-income families suddenly had the option of sending their children to non-district schools? The district public schools would suddenly be subject to the whims of the market, and that's the last thing they want. But it's the best thing for parents and kids. So I'm going to play for you a clip from a local news program in Utah where they have public charter schools. Now, public charter schools are open to all students, and they don't charge tuition, so, so anybody can go regardless of income. Um, and because of the presence of charter schools, the public schools have learned to deal with the hard kind of accountability, market accountability, and the results are great. So in this clip, a principal at a district public high school talks up his school's offerings because it's just about time for parents to make their decisions about school for next year. Listen to this. Let's say your kid loves to cook, but your neighborhood school doesn't have a culinary arts program. What can you do? Today we're talking to Dr. Brian McGill, principal at Alta High School, about the law that kind of helps parents make enrollment choices based on their kids' needs and their families' needs. Thanks so much for being here, Dr. McGill. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Appreciate having me. Yeah, so let's talk about this. I mean, what is this law? What's this rule? So basically, uh, in the state of Utah, the legislature has a standard open permit law process that allows students and parents to basically choose uh, the school of their choice. Uh, the permit window opens December 1st and runs through uh, third week of February, so February 21st. And it allows uh, students and parents to basically seek out schools that's the best fit for their child. So like in the case of Alta High School, uh, we have over 500 students that actually permit into our school okay. that that's live outside number. the context of our boundary, yeah. Got it, so what are some of the main reasons students are transferring into your school? So um, one of my jobs is to try to provide as many leadership and academic curricular and extracurricular opportunities as possible. Uh, so we have some pretty unique programs to our school. We have a Step to the U program, uh, which is an early college pathway. We have a partnership with the University of Utah, and it allows students to earn their general education certificate by the time they would start their first freshman fall year semester. Awesome. Um, at the cost of $120, so it's, oh, it's pretty incredible. What a great program. And then we have things like engineering, uh, we have a pre-law pathway at our school, we have mm -hmm. a culinary arts program, our marching band uh, is a big hit as well, it draws a lot of students in. So uh, again, just providing as many unique academic opportunities for students so they can feel engaged and connected to school. So I'm sure that there is, there's some limitations as far as, as uh, you, so you mentioned a timeline here, about how many students are, are accepted based on that enrollment path? So pretty much unless a school is on moratorium status, which means if their enrollment has hit 90%, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're the community hub school for that, that particular community. But if we haven't hit that moratorium status, um, schools are really good about accepting and taking in students that are interested in making a, a connection with that particular institution. So. I'm curious about transportation. So if you're choosing a school that's maybe outside of your boundaries, are there transportation options for students? So in, in the case of Canyon School District, we have our traditional bus routes that we offer, but we have a lot of students and uh, parents who actually just drive to campus. So we've got students that come to us from West Valley, Tooele, uh, believe it or not. Wow, um, that's Alpine, a drive. Yeah, Alpine School District area, mm -hmm. uh, and then you know the west side, southwest side of Salt Lake Valley. So Lots of carpools going on. Lots of carpools going on. Yeah, yep, people making it work. It. Cool, yeah. perfect. Um, can you talk to me a little bit more about that? Is it like an arduous application? Is it just a form that you hand in? Yeah, so in the case of Canyon School District, uh, it's pretty simple. You can go onto the Canyon School District website, uh, pull up the open, standard open uh, permit process, fill it out. It's basically just a one page uh, document of information. And Canyons, you can actually submit that electronically to the school. And then as an administrative team, we can go through and evaluate the information and we can send. Uh, nearly an immediate response back, letting the student and parent know if they've been accepted. Awesome. So, so you don't have to wait a long time right. to find out. Yep. You can make your plans immediately. Exactly. Okay, perfect. Dr. McGill, thanks so much for being here this morning. I appreciate it. Interesting program. We'll have this and obviously more information, a link to that form on our website, online at abc4.com. Slash GMU. Brian? All right. Can you hear the difference between regulatory accountability, which the administrators in Utah also have to deal with, by the way, and market accountability, which prompts district public schools to develop the kinds of programs that parents want. 
I would love it if we had at my kids' high school in Nebraska um, the option of having them get UNL credit for $120. Um, that would be amazing. But we don't have that kind of an option. So before we moved to Nebraska, we lived in Colorado, which has had market accountability in K-12 education since 1992. That's when um, charter schools were first adopted. So our kids attended both district and charter schools there, and I can tell you that the environment is totally different. So in both kinds of schools, just the district and the charter, teachers and administrators were keenly interested in what parents wanted. And of course, they still had regulatory accountability, but that's not what makes the difference. It's the market accountability that matters. So when there's market accountability, all children benefit, not just the kids who go to a different kind of school outside of the regular public schools. And the reason is because suddenly all of the principals in all of the different kinds of schools are very tuned in to what parents want. And if you look at what parents want, it's, it's always the best interest of their children. So it's that old saying, the rising tide lifts all boats. If we had school choice in Nebraska, the quality at all of the schools would rise. It's a win-win. So I can hear the Nebraska administrators from here. They're saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. What about the third kind of accountability? School boards elected by the public. The idea is that members of the school board represent people in their districts and like if a parent had a problem they would go to their school board member and the school board member would go to the district and say look we got to fix this because we have concerns. And on paper that sounds great but that's not how it works around here. So maybe in some places there's a tiny bit of accountability that comes from school board members but in Nebraska it doesn't exist. In fact from what I've seen here in Lincoln the school board works against parents not for us. They stand shoulder to shoulder with administrators and even the media to squash the concerns of parents and rubber stamp everything the district wants. Regulatory accountability is nice for government employees, but it can be pretty awful for parents and students. Now, I'm going to pronounce an understatement here. When I ran for school board in Lincoln, the district did not want me to win. <laughs> Uh, one day, I got a phone call from someone at district administration, and she said something like this. The Lincoln Journal Star called and asked us for some information about your children's enrollment at LPS. Under policy, blah, 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 I don't remember what it was, we can give certain student information to the media. We're not calling to ask permission. We've already done it. We just wanted to let you know. Okay, so you're using a regulation to leak minors' information to the media. Got it. Nice accountability. So after the Lincoln Journal Star's article was printed containing my kids' student information, a local radio talk show host called me and asked how the newspaper got the information. I told him about the phone call from the district and he couldn't believe it. He was furious. So why would the newspaper be in on this regulatory-based effort to intimidate a candidate for school board? The enormous amount of taxpayer money that we pay the district to educate our kids uh, branches out into lots of other areas. And then all of those other areas become invested in the monopoly status quo. There is just such an amazing fund of money there that so many people benefit from. It's probably no secret that newspaper reporting doesn't pay much these days. But if you're friendly to the school district, you can springboard your reporter job into a lucrative career at the district. Mary Kay Roth worked as a reporter at the Journal Star, and then she transitioned to LPS to be communications director at the school district. In 2017, she made $102,451 of our taxpayer money from the school district. I'm guessing that's probably at least double what she made at the Lincoln Journal Star. It's all so cozy in the regulatory world when you're free from market accountability. In short, accountability is lacking in the public schools in Nebraska. We have regulations galore. Unfortunately, these are top-down, not agile, not market-based regulations that probably do a lot of interfering with uh, what students actually need. This, uh, the encyclopedia regulation that I read to you is still current. These are current regulations on the books at the Nebraska Department of Education. 
when's the last time you told a kid to go look something up in an encyclopedia? <laughs> and yet our private schools are required to, to have them still. So the regulatory accountability, I would say in many cases is less than helpful. Should we get rid of all regulations in education? Of course not. Um, we've got to have some standards, but in, in general, the, the regulatory is, is out of control. Market accountability is what we need because it's adaptable, it's agile. We hear all the time about how jobs, technology, they're changing so fast and that we have to prepare these kids for the future. We've got to, we've got to prepare them to work in the job market, which is so different than it was 10, 20 years ago. And yet, we, uh, we don't allow schools to, um, to use market accountability to improve themselves. I am so excited for when market accountability finally arrives in Nebraska. I've seen a lot of wonderful educators and innovators inhibited because of the regulatory burden that is placed on them by people who just want to preserve the status quo. The status quo is so lucrative for so many people, and they will fight against market accountability. They don't want that kind of accountability. They would like to stick to the easy stuff, the regulatory accountability, which is, you know, the basic stuff. If you want to run any kind of organization, that's the stuff that you do in the back room at night when the when the customers have gone home and are happy with what you have served them that day. Thanks for tuning in today. And you can always find us on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and, um, and on our website at www.schoolchoicenebraska.org. Have a good one.